Hello everyone, today we talk about the blurring in the difference between the Servi Dominici and the Massari in seigneurial, in the seigneurial system, manorial system, uh, court, uh, courtly system, wherever you want to talk about from the courtes, you know, high medieval Europe, and fundamentally the, the, the first steps of what we call, you know, we'd, we'd all do uh, contextualizations as fe feudalism, as it did, say better, vassalatic beneficiary system. But today we take a look chiefly at the juridical condition of the men that worked uh, on this land, on the families actually, that worked on these lands, and how certain specific dynamics um, began to separate the initial, whether there a ever actually was at, at a given point a sharp differentiation between the uh, the the domain the, the the serfs worked on the seigneurial lands proper, and the freemen that were just born in theory from a you know in, in a mutual relationship of you know in fact freedom bread that was declining a bit uh, with the lord in in, in land they, that belonged to them. Uh, it, it's a while we don't discuss the the seigneurial system, so it, probably the the videos I made already are. They are all in the medieval society playlist, but a bit old, so maybe at some point we'll have to update here and there. But this this dynamic is very fascinating because it already tells you an important amount of stuff on, on the period. So we can say, if we analyze uh, like in those videos, in fact, the the seigneurial system, how uh, it, it was evident really how it, it, this system was the result of a balance that had been consciously reached in the managing of the um, agrarian tax, uh, you know, farms, uh, business too, broadly speaking, because the, you see, um, in certain areas, this, this rights were also monetized, right? It wasn't just about the land, the land demands this kind of ideally standard unit of land measurement was a bit universal, but still, uh, especially in the most monetized areas in Europe, uh, there was, you know, it was the, the, the boundary, in fact, properly the territorial land boundary in here was pretty blurred in a sense, and seigneuries also began to develop sometimes, but, you know, very, mm, in a non, um, say, organic, uh, compact quantity of land, but scattered here and there, eventually. But this is another thing. Um, so both, actually, the tax, so the public, lands, um, the one of the fiscus, let's say, and the seigneurial ones, in, in sense now, basically private property, as it was being formed during this centuries as something that, uh, such as the Allodium, couldn't even be touched by public authority proper. Um, um, after a series of nat naturally experimentations of experience and imitations among the great land owners that in this sense, we're not just literally the nobility, right? This was still a fluid moment where even rich peasants could, rich farmers could become someone in, in the process. Um, but this balance was naturally a precarious one because um, essentially because of the dynamism of the, 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 the estates proper. Because think about the successory, the, the inheritance split, Right, donations, purchases, so um, all events that could naturally fragment this um, seigneurial estate. So every time that, uh, and this was a bit the default, right, of also the, the broader Carolingian system where the Vassalatic beneficiary one has stemmed, right, from also earlier, um, you know, systems of land exploitation that date back to, to Roman times, even. Um, and the idea that, for example, uh, you know, of course, every male son had, unless, you know, he entered the church, and that was a strategy also because private foundations, private ecclesiastical foundations were a very sound investment because they couldn't be confiscated. So as long as there was some family member there and you could maintain it, uh, maintain this property in your own asset, you know, nobody could really touch it, namely. Or it was one of the most profitable investments but for um, as far as the secular power w was concerned naturally every time that a heir or even a donor because this could even happen literally at the moment of death with true testament right there were lots of donations um, um, 
the object of the transfer, um, the, it, it wasn't the entire Kurtis, right? It wasn't the entire system had, as it had been ideally formed in, in school books, like with the center, the seigneurial land, with just the, the serfs working and around all the freemen that were ever more tied to the Lord. This thing went split in a way or another. So, not just in more, in one and more mansi, plural of mansus, but sometimes the same courtes from which the, um, the, the mansi had been detached had to rebuild its own internal balance, right? Because literally the courtes was there because it could draw resources from the surroundings and when these surroundings were split, naturally this was an important thing for the courtes because another one could be formed, for example, and you had also to be on your own. Um, so, literally, the, the, the court had to be sometimes shifted, right? Um, and um, sometimes the same court is passed by donation to an entity, could be the church, could be whoever, or a lord, um, either by uh, inheritance or, or, or gift or purchase, etc. So, these months, uh, did this happen to to, to this, the broader uh, uh, courtes meant as the sum of the mansi that made it up. So even more serious were the consequences of a division when this invested the the reserve, right? Um, that is the, that part, the core land, where the fundamentally the lord s stuck all the the majority of resources. It was effectively the center of the courtes itself. Um, and this was very important, especially from the seigneurial pers from the lay perspective, lay lords, because of the aforementioned equity towards the uh, the heirs mm -hmm. that said, okay, yes, our father, I don't know, had this this I don't know this malt and with its um, its stocks and all this stuff. And how do we split it fundamentally? Um, so um, this was solved by uh, dividing in equal parts such of the most remunerative courts, that is to say, of course, uh, okay, they, 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 literally the same places weren't split, you know, shared, but literally, okay, it, it was uh, calculated how remunerative a certain amount of land was, and you would try independently from the extensional surface or the actual infrastructures that were there, how remunerative that was, and so that everybody could be namely satisfied. And of course, it's how divorce feuds, as always, like today, as back in the day, happened for these reasons, or inheritance reasons. But um, but the mobility of the asset uh, became too, let's say, excessively, you know, too frequently, at, at least, kind of upsetting the broader seigneurial system, the, the broader court as such, right? So that somewhat entered in crisis in a way that it shifted the interest of the owner rather towards the massaricium, so where the freemen worked fundamentally, where the the, uh, the lord had a power, but just in, namely on contract on a contractual basis, not because of full property, right? Because if, if anything, because the land was, was, wasn't his, the people that worked on it were free, right? Unlike the uh, the reserve, for example, and with the serfs that worked for him, they were literally a private property uh, of the nobleman. So um, this is the, the Masaricium became to be more profitable, essentially for one reason, because it didn't demand necessary care for the functioning of, of the seigneurial re seigneurial reserve. Right. This means that it just the, the lords normally from from this land could easily cash. Right, because the land theoretically was administrated by the local freemen, um, and they already had some kind of autonomy, like the one that had tied it, paradoxically, in part to the lord, freely, namely, um, even if it usually didn't happen like that. Or that you know, they, they engage into broader contexts, etc. This means that um, the uh, and 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 the lord in this sense had just to ask for a census, as we will see now, whereas for caring of his own reserve. He had literally to invest his own labor force and to make things done, to build other stuff. And it was more complicated, right, um, in a way. 
uh, of course there was an advantage was der deriving from the, the actual quality of the reserve, but let's say it was uh, it entailed a, a, a more direct commitment to to work on that land. And this means that among the advantages that were procured by the Masaricum, there was also the emergency um, the emergence, excuse me, of the, the in, in the attention of the owner, let's say, the one procured by the payment of census that could be either in nature or in money. At this time starts timidly, you know, re you know, growing in a sense in Western Europe. And it we went um slightly uh, you know and and it brought to the gradually to the decline in importance of the um you know work exactions fundamentally. So we can explain the fact that in the Carolingian age, albeit the reserve still had a rather prevalent um, place in uh, in the vessel like beneficiary economy um, there are already are already to be found in the Massaricium together with Massari of free condition actually not just a few Massari of servile condition right and this witnesses basically a shift of, it, of labor force on the territory, literally from the Dominicum to the Massaricio. Right? A shift that would have actually a lot of juridical social consequences because, you see, the Massaricio serfs tended to assimilate to the other Massari in this way. Uh, they lived in the same place and the assimilation came, though gradually as well, and extremely gradually in some most cases, let's say. In, in a first phase, the the servant that was placed in the Massaricium was burdened with duties that were decisively superior to the ones of the other Massari, right? Because the working uh, performances that were required arbitrarily to him by the, by the master, according to the very, you know, changing needs of the reserve uh, and uh, to which its own mansus was connected, right? That is to say, without um, any more those exact numerical numerical determinations of days of, of weeks that were instead um, present in the contracts and in the customs relative locally, the you know the massari of free condition, because the land was still massarian, but still the guy that worked on it was was not free so it depended still on the master that and the dominus that told him look you know you still have to basically work the way you, you were used to and in here in the polyptics so these documents that basically there are very few like so the best the, the we made a video on this the, the, the northern france and northern italy essentially present with these extraordinary documents of, of the time that are without which otherwise we wouldn't know much about the productivity and is you know the, the land exploitation forms in Carolingian times, the distinction between the servile mansi and the one of so-called um, let's say uh, free ones, let's say the nuial ones, because they were originally attributed to free people. So there is still the difference as far as the the mansi were concerned, not about the people though. This could could switch now, and originally at least because in in reality, from the politic the polyptics that at least we 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 know, it's um, soon evident that the denomination of servile remained inherent to the single mansus even when this passed from a servant to a freeman. Mm -hmm. And similarly, a mansus kept to be called free, let's say, um, uh, and therefore to to be less burdened compared to the servile ones even when it passed from a freeman to a servant. So evidently the pure concern to maintain a fixed income let's say complexively um, in the in the in the courtis prompted um, just lazily to to preserve the denominations and the customary burdens of the demands. Right. Uh, 
let's say, neglecting the changes that sometimes happened, of course, in the persons to which the Mansi were entrusted, um, which naturally speaks for for a kind of a blending of of the conditions of, of the people uh, themselves at this point, and 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 therefore neglecting exactly that personal juridical condition that had given origin, given birth to the different denomination of, of the land unit, right? And it is true, though, even in here, that even later, in the second phase, the servant, even in the eventuality that it would become the title holder of the man, of the free mansus, remained a servant for what concerned his person. That is, he was naturally uh, subjected to the dominus uh, will, and uh, you know, if he wanted, famously enough, you know, he wanted to get married, to have children. Uh, he had to ask for permission. Uh, the the dominus could grant or not the, the marriage, or posing certain conditions. Um, this is very. This was an enorm enormously important because uh, these people could marry into uh, into families that lived on in other uh, in other lords' lands. So this created certain difficulties, also to maintain the stability sometimes of, the, of, the, of this nuclei, um, and uh, so they couldn't, of course, abandon the land, right? Um, and um, the children also could be separated from the father by the dominus and to be used uh, in any other place, right? These were s basically slaves, as you understand, rather. Uh, we'll talk about that a bit later. And furthermore, uh, in fact, as a slave proper, uh, the, 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 the servant was granted the formation of some uh, property, but at his death, um, his dominus had the right to seize it, at least in part, because the thing was, was naturally also left in part of the same family. I mean, it was the interest of the dominus as well, not to ravage dramatically these, these servants' resources, and as we have explained elsewhere, it wasn't really just like a matter of, you know, uh, predatory mind. It was like they needed these resources that in the vassalitic beneficiary system were constantly reinvested in the community. Right, they weren't treasured without being spent because simply the lords couldn't afford such a thing. They had, they were always threatened from annihilation, being in one or another. So uh, this was a necessity, and also these servants, as we've just seen, you know, in part, we, they also had it would have it better in in certain situations than the same freemen. Um, the the speaking of the mansus a little bit better. I want to say something that. Um, um, the servile mansus entailed for the freemen that accepted to cultivate it uh, was ob obliged by the needs here because they were, these freemen were, were starting to be desperate uh, at some point as much as the serfs. The same in fact of obligements, the same duties of the servile, the previous servile family and this happened because the dominus naturally didn't want to renounce to income and, and you know supplementary income and service compared to the ones that would be you know uh, exactable demandable from from the freemen and this this often happened and and that's also how at the end of the day the difference between the freemen and, and the serfs began to 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 level you know uh, at least in juridical terms but also in social ones very often concretely so to the tendency to assimilation of the Massari serfs of the free Massari happened only uh, gradually, right? It was something very slow. But in this first grade of approaching in the working condition was the premise for a further secular evolution, right? That would eventually flow um, out in, in the, around the year 1000 in the creation of a rural class of non-freemen in which were confused many among the 
descendants of the ancient Serbs, with many among the descendants of the uh, of the free Masari, the free peasants. And we often use the term serfdom to denominate the condition of the say uh, of that future non-free class that you know we distinguish from ancient slavery uh, uh, and also partly the early medieval one. But in the sources, in many regions, um, that is usually when in the centuries a semantic evolution of the term servus uh, takes place, there isn't quite of a terminological distinction either from, from before. Right, so the, the boundaries are quite blurred, but in order to intend the nature that at some point the serfdom would would acquire proper we must consider certain deep changes in the political structures of post Carolingian times because it's not just in, I mean um, in the ancient world you had literally lots and lots of people that could be easily controlled right and spent because there would be many others who could take their place in early medieval times it wasn't like that you couldn't treat these people literally as slaves uh, like in extermination camps, like, I don't know, Roman latifundium very often looked like. Um, these things were, you know, living conditions were brutal, inimaginable, but still things like, I don't know, labor force was needed more, way more preciously in early, in high med even high medieval times than, than before. So, in a way, uh, this is not just uh, economically uh, explainable, but it's really f from a political point of view I and mean, think about all the migrations and incursions of nomads and semi-nomads that reached the Latin Germanic world under Frankish Germany um, or you know the, the the expansion of the Arab Empire and so um, there is definitely a pressure here it was exercised from, from the external on, on the political formations of the sedentaries um, that um, really have a lot to do, even in not just working, but also fighting force, with the change in juridical also condition of these um, of these people that is not just easily, you know, uh, representable as you know. It really wasn't that different from ancient. Uh, slavery. It, it was substantially different. It was enough different to to make the, the same Europe evolve in, let's say, towards different directions. Always given that, surely these times weren't that much. I mean, uh, the the Latin Germanic structures at this point were very slowly, albeit deeply, like changing the 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 the, the picture, but still, you know. Um, this dynamic must be recognized, and we, we, we must absolutely talk about it at some point uh, better. So it was really brief um, for today, but I hope to have made some point um, you know, on aspects that are usually overlooked. But this flattening of juridical and social conditions is in a way, uh, it was in a way, uh, we can't say necessary, but still it corresponded to very specific dynamics that are not just you know the the greed or the exploitation it was definitely a an important there was an important logic behind them just as there was before and even in the most atrocious terms of you know conditions these people lived in and it was really bad i mean in terms of actual exploitation but uh, still it either worked like that or there would have, I mean, these people alone, uh, without a, a lordly lead, let's say, would have not achieved much better, probably, um, and or would have been given origin to 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 a, to a similar system at the end of the day, because the tendency also in medieval times is to the oligarchization, until the modern age where things began to to change, but even in there for the expansion of other. Uh, into other areas, markets, resources, and that's another another thing. But for now, we stop here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. 
And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.